welcome to a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York for funding this series and enabling us to put this on each week. Today we are joined by Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Lance Gatling. He will be presenting on Meiji History 101, Feudal Backwater to Regional Power in 45 Years. Lance Gatling is the founder of the Kano Chronicles, a unique Japanese history project. He also founded Nexio Research, a consultancy base in Tokyo, Japan, serving the defense, space, and government markets. He retired from the U.S. Army as a lieutenant colonel after serving as a Northeast Asia foreign area officer and military operational planner for the bilateral defense of Japan and as a foreign services officer for the U.S. State Department. Mr. Gatling earned his Bachelor of Science at the U.S. Military at West Point and Master's Degree in Public Service at Western Kentucky University and National Security Affairs East Asia Studies at the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School. To read more about Mr. Gatling's biography, please uh, refer to our website. And Mr. Gatling, it's a pleasure to have you with us here today. I'll let you take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Amani. Uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome from the future, uh, where it's a beautiful morning here in Tokyo, 10 o'clock, uh, Tuesday. And uh, I was asked to present a, a brief history of Meiji, uh, the Meiji era of Japan. And then I was told it was 30 minutes, which was a pretty daunting task. So what I, what I did was think about what I would like to have known when I started studying Japanese history uh, 35 years ago. Uh, which I didn't know because uh, a lot of the histories didn't cover what I was interested in uh, and what I thought was important. And what would be important is to understand the uh, the influence of that time on the modern Japan, the culture that you see, uh, the history that intervened between then and today. Uh, wh what was the basis for all of that? How, how did this uh, evolve? And what you find is history specialists who focus on one one area in order to fulfill a PhD, but there are very few generalists who, uh, who do a really great job. And what I'll do is post um, post some of their books, some of these generalist books on my website, um, which I think are very useful for people that are really interested in uh, Meiji 101. I would like to thank YCAPS for making this opportunity uh, available to me. And then uh, to the Japan Foundation of New York, uh, years ago, I actually approached the Japan Foundation in Japan to talk about uh, sponsoring a large uh, martial arts organization to which I belong. And they pointed out that they had already done that. They already had uh, sponsored the Aikikai. They had sponsored uh, the Nippon Budokan. They had sponsored many, many of these uh, activities and said, essentially, we already have one, but thank you for asking. Uh, so they do, today they don't do martial arts, but they do history, and I do appreciate that. My thanks go out to them. So without further ado, let me uh, share my screen, if I can get the right one. And here we go. All right, so uh, my task is to, to pile all this into, into 30 minutes, which is pretty daunting given that given that the Japan literally went from a feudal backwater in 1867-68 uh, when uh, Meiji restoration takes place. It's actually a coup uh, of a sort where the, the top is swapped out and they, in fact, make the uh, emperor in charge again, but he's, he's being handled by a whole lot of people uh, that become pretty famous, some of which are, are not uh, very famous today. Uh, but very interesting folks. And one of those folks uh, involved in this uh, is the subject of my primary history research, which is Kano Jigoro. He was the founder of judo, which is how I got interested in him, but also he founded Japanese amateur sports. He was the third uh, highest ranking bureaucrat in the Ministry of Education. He was the he was, in fact, most times the the uh, senior most professional in the Ministry of Education for almost 25 years. So he was involved in all of these decisions regarding uh, what culture would be taught, what um, ethics would be taught in Japan, uh, how the history would be summarized. 
Uh, and he had, he taught many of the people that were later the decision makers and the movers and shakers. So it, this this world in Tokyo, which controlled most of Japan, was very small. So they're all intermarried. They all knew each other. Kano taught most of their children at one time or another. So he was very influential. Um, so I, I kind of came at this backwards to understand the uh, environment in which this man grew up and the impact that he had on Japan and the world. So look, let's look at uh, Japan just before the Meiji Restoration. There are about almost 250 different uh, subcategories of some government or another, uh, and they're and they're grouped by their proximity to the Tokugawa family. Uh, so these are the these are actually Ki, Owari Khan, and uh, Mito. These are close relatives of the Tokugawas, who of course are here in Edo, um, and then the rest of them are scattered out. But if you see how Japan is laid out. Uh, they have surrounded themselves with family and close relatives. And then farther you get away from Tokyo, uh, the farther you get away from Edo, the, the more distant they are. And sometimes they're in actual opposition to the uh, Bakufu, the main uh, government in Meiji. And that all happens on the three main islands of Japan. There's only a tiny presence in Hokkaido at the time. The rest of Hokkaido is called Ezo. Uh, the Matsumai Han is given a uh, monopoly on trade, and they mostly trade in uh, seafood and uh, seal skins and things like that with the Ainu and even the Russians bringing that in. And the rest of Japan is based on a rice culture primarily. There are extractive industries uh, like uh, silver and gold. Uh, which they can trade. But the Ryukyu is a semi-independent kingdom. Of course, Korea is an independent kingdom under the suzerainty of China at the time. Um, so there are about 30 million people uh, in the entire uh, Japanese population. About 6% of those are samurai. But by by this time, they had already signed, the Bakfu had already signed unequal treaties with the United States, Russia, France, uh, others uh, guaranteeing trade and opening uh, treaty ports, including Hyogo, which today we call Kobe. And in my research, I realized that there was a Kobe incident in February 1868 in which the U.S. Marines, along with uh, French sailors and uh, other Western powers soldiers, actually occupy Kobe, downtown Kobe. They have a running gun battle. Uh, that's caused by two uh, French sailors coming out of a, a grog house, which is uh, one uh, one account called it. So they're coming out, they're drunk with sake, they run into a line of march, and one of the worst things you could possibly do to insult a samurai or the daimyo uh, of this powerful Bizen Han um, was to cross the line of march, and they're marching through downtown Kobe, and they were supposed to skirt around the city, and they took a shortcut. They went through downtown Kobe. Two two guys come out drunk. They get in a fight. Um, a, a young samurai grabs a spear, tries to warn them off. They don't understand each other. He stabs a couple of them. Minor injuries. They come back out with guns. It turned out that this Japanese unit, this Bizen unit, was armed with repeating rifles and a modern cannon, one of the very few units like that in Japan at the time. Yet the U.S. Marines uh, came in, took over the city, ran them out of the town. Uh, the, only in, the only injury was an old Japanese woman that the Japanese managed to shoot. Um, they tried to shoot everybody, all the Westerners in sight, and there were a lot of them there because they were just formally opening the port of Shogo, Kobe. Um, so many of the foreign ministers were there, and also most of the modern um, Meiji era Japanese warships were there, which were all captured. This is a disaster for the Japanese, yet it never shows up in the Japanese history books. Why? Why was it a disaster? The Japanese had seen what was going on in China. Every time they fought the West, they lost something. Here's the second opium war where the British troops take Beijing. And what they end up with is Hong Kong. And they only recently gave Hong Kong back and they gave it back earlier than the actual lease. So the Japanese were very aware of this and very concerned that this was uh, gonna create a huge problem for them, uh, that they had these Western powers. So they sent the brand new uh, Bugyo, head of international relations, all of 26-year-old Ito Hirobumi, who later becomes a prime minister uh, several times for a long period of time in Japan, very famous, uh, later assassinated because he got involved in Korean independence politics as the governor general there. But they send him, uh, he, he rides overnight to get to Kobe. He's trying to negotiate with him and all the Western powers who have been negotiating this treaty, this entire deal for almost 10 years, say, where are the old men, the powerful men close to the... Uh, 
to the shogun and close to the emperor that we've been negotiating with. And here he is by himself. He says, well, I'm in charge now. We have a new government. The Western powers didn't even know it at the time. It had happened so quickly. Uh, they actually sent him away, said they wouldn't talk to him. Finally, the emperor had to send his personal representative to say, yes, in fact, Ito Hirabumi represents this new government. We we no longer represent, uh, we no longer recognize or support the shogun who has uh, abdicated, and the Boshin Senso breaks out. So meanwhile, the Japanese have the U.S. Marines and the French sailors occupying one of their major cities. And this is a disaster. They finally say, look, we're going to... Uh, support we're going to abide by all of the unequal treaties that we're already signed up for we're going to support them all and they they worked out a deal the deal uh, which involved the uh, samurai who had used the sword actually commits seppuku he's talked into it take the responsibility for the entire country of japan they said they'd take care of his family so here we are at the uh, at the reading of the emperor's oath it's often called the charter oath so that the question was, what are we going to do now that we have a new government? What do we do with it? Well, first off, they retained a lot of the old samurai to keep running things that they had been running. So the city of Edo didn't just stop. They had hundreds and you know thousands of samurai and administrators. So they needed those people to continue in their jobs. Oh. They didn't have a government. If the if the shogunate just walked away and all of their powers are gone, like how do you how do you collect taxes? How do you feed the people? How do you how do you run things? How do you even know what's going on in this massive, massively long country? So the emperor has an oath and the 14 year old, so he didn't write this up. Uh, so he's the emperor uh, states his oath and he's, he says he's going to do his best and everyone stick with me if you notice he has all the daimyo and all the all the top people in this uh, special hall in in kyoto it's a semi-religious uh facility in kyoto that stands today and he brings everyone in and essentially binds all of them he makes an oath to them and they respond and they accept his oath and then this gentleman here is reading to the gods these are confucian gods uh, these are the the wise men the saying um he's reading the 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 five articles to them the five articles essentially said and this is not the promise of the emperor but they just said oh by the way the emperor made this oath and we got this we have these five articles so it's a very ambiguous relationship between the emperor's oath and the articles but the articles essentially make the promise that we're going to have a representative form of government and we're going to determine all matters of state by public discussion, which is very, very different from having the shogunate, the bakufu, okay? Also, he says, or the, the articles say that we're going to seek knowledge throughout the world, and this is the, this is the foundations of this imperial nation. So they set this expectation that they're going to move quickly into a representative form of government, but they don't do it. Uh, they don't, they can't do it immediately. What they do is set in a government that's patterned after the um, ancient Dajokan state council form of government that was in the Naran uh, periods and Han periods. So this is, you know, th these are already almost 2000 year old uh, form of government. And this is where you get the minister of the left and the minister of the right. And they're all appointed, but they uh, there's very careful thought into putting in the people who can play off against each other so that the center can actually control everything that goes on. Um, and of course, these are these appointed people are elites. They're not elected representatives. They are no way this is a democracy. Uh, but it, Saigo Takamori, who is a very famous and important uh, character in Japanese history, argues that, in fact, uh, they should include former imperial supporters in the government, and they do that. So they, they have a pretty good representation from both sides of the government. Of course, there are certain top people in the uh, uh, the, the shogunate who are not welcome immediately. Some of them are later uh, recycled after, after a fashion and brought into the government. Excuse me, my screen locked up. Okay, so the situation, and I've got a lot of junk on my screen. I hope everybody else can see this. Um, the situation in Japan at the time, and it continues after the Meiji Restoration for years, at the top of the pyramid, of course, you have the emperor. Then you have the court nobility, the kuge. Uh, the shogun, who is a highest level samurai, rules the country as uh, in the name of the emperor. Uh, under him are the daimyo, the people uh, that I showed earlier in the different han around the country. Um, they, in fact, are 
uh, actually in charge and they work up. The samurai is complicated. It can be up to 32 levels of samurai in some of these Han. And then you have the commoners, uh, the nomin, the f farmers, fishermen, and all of this. About 6% overall. Then you have the people who are outside the class system, the priests, the nuns, and most flam famously, the eta, the untouchables, the social outcasts who are made unclean by their occupations, according to Buddhism, the handlers of the dead, the tanners, the butchers. And then the, the children of those people become outside of the caste system. So when Meiji starts to address this issue, there's the, at first they say everybody's the same class, and there's so much pushback from the elites that they finally d d devised a three uh, layer caste system, the Kazoku, the former nobles, the Shizoku, the former samurai, and the Heimin. But this is based on uh, very much on the finances of the country and the finances that they were able to pay these people off because all of these people were getting regular stipends from the government. So a large number of the samurai became commoners. What's that mean? It means a lot of these low level samurai are already upset with the government from the very beginning that they have been denied their traditional birthright, some of them samurai for hundreds of years, and they and this is a guarantee of unrest amongst the losers in this system. What does the government do with all these people? After a while, King Sho of Okinawa and all the former daimyo are ordered to Tokyo. All their property reverts to the emperor. Essentially, it becomes government property. Uh, and the Meiji government continues to pay annual stipends, and the uh, the measurement is or koku is 150 around 150 kilograms of rice. It's it's enough rice for one man to live for uh, a year. And then later they finally just said we can't do this. They issued government bonds where 46 years worth of this stipend annual stipend. That's a lot of money if you're the, one of the top guys. If you're one of the lower level guys, it doesn't mean much. And they typically sold these bonds for next to nothing because they didn't know how to handle finances or anything else. So the, the top the top folks became very rich, the lower folks were broke. And that means that the higher level educated samurai, even if they didn't have any cash, they could be hired out to continue their work as administrators because that's what the samurai had mostly be become by then. And the lower level, less educated samurais were reduced to uh, be, uh, providing labor and they were pretty poor. So the domestic fo focus of Japan and the government was on fixing Japan so that Japan could fa in fact become part of, uh, become the, the equal of the Western nations that imposed the unequal treaties. That was a requirement for all of these treaties to be re renegotiated was that Japan would have to have, for example, a new justice system so they would not have extraterritorial uh, protection, uh, that the any any crimes would, in fact, be dealt with by the Japanese legal system, not by the the uh, uh, sorry the Western legal system. And then the Korea question. So you have this question of domestic policy versus international policy. But some said that Korea was such a burning question that it had to be dealt with. Now everybody else said, no, we have to uh, we have to deal with the unequal treaties, and therefore we have to focus on domestic development before we go there. And remember that all the other countries, particularly the Brits, uh, British and the Russians are fighting the, the great game across Asia. So the Korea question kind of rips uh, Japan apart. And in Saigo, Takamori leaves the government uh, and starts a rebellion in 1877. It's crushed within months. Um, a lot of people go to jail. Uh, the, the leaders are executed. And if you don't know this, Sa Saigo Takamori was the role model for the last samurai movie. Uh, the Japanese leader in that. So what's going on outside Japan that's having an impact? The Russian expansion across Asia, across Siberia, even into what is today Alaska and all the way down into Oregon, uh, California, is, uh, it, and it's essentially they're encircling Japan, uh, sorry, China. And the Chinese, and, and by the way, this is an era in which uh, political cartoons become uh, readily available, widely printed, uh, widely copied, and they're marvelous. I mean, they can be as racist as anything, but they are stereotypes, and I think they're an incredible uh, visual aid to understand what was going on at the time. Here are the, here are the major powers dividing up China. Uh, of course, this is Queen Victoria uh, from the United Kingdom, the German Kaiser, the Russian Tsar, um, a, a beautiful woman representing France because they change their government every other week. And here's the Japanese trying to figure out how do we play in this game? And see, and, and if you look, you look closely, there are already pieces of the pie uh, with their names on it. And where, like this is Port Arthur, 
for the Russians. They already know. And of course, they're all ignoring the Chinese because the Chinese are powerless. This is what Japan wants to avoid. It, 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 by any means, it must avoid having the same thing happen to Japan. Now, that shouldn't be there. <laughs> it should be later. I think it is later. So um, so these fears, remember that the, the uh, in, during the Edo period, the Japanese Han had only been here, and they really had not settled Hokkaido, which was called Ezo. Uh, so what they actually had a Tonden no He uh, program that was patterned after the Cossacks of the Russians and how the Cossacks had salted Cossack, uh, Russians had salted Cossack units across Siberia to help in managing the natives and uh, collecting taxes. And in an emergency, they could provide a military unit. That's exactly what the Japanese did, the Tonanohe. And they started up here in what is today's Sapporo, go up the Central Valley, and then off into the uh, here, because they're concerned about Russian incursions into here to try to make it a Russian island. This is, this is Amer uh, Japan's far west, like America. And this is how primitive it was. Here's the Meiji emperor inspecting a Tondenohe farm. If you note, there are men in uh, military uniform mixed in with the uh, farmers, the workers, the peasants, uh, and they are the military colonists. And this is downtown Sapporo today. So the thought came up that a Wakon Yosai, a Japanese spirit with Western learning, would be, uh, would be the way that Japan uh, would handle the world. So they went around the world and, and picked up what they thought was the best example of everything. Education system, army, navy, telegraphs, universities, agricultural technology, you name it, it all came from foreigners. And these foreigners, uh, sometimes these are Japanese and went overseas and studied and brought back the know-how, but but for the, inner, for the uh, initial stages, they had to fire, hire Westerners called Oyatoi, foreign uh, the honorable hired foreigner is kind of how it translates. And these are foreign instructors who played a huge role in the education of the new Japan. All the students going into the, the new uh, Tokyo University had to speak English and read it well enough to be taught at university level in English because these gentlemen, of course, didn't teach, uh, didn't speak Japanese. So Ernest Fenelosa, for example, came in and taught for uh, five, six years. And he later, at the time, nobody wanted Japanese art, so he bought all the Japanese art he could carry home, and he contributed, and that became the core of the Boston Museum of Oriental Art, and what, he later became a director there. But it was hugely expensive. The, the national budget was primarily spent up in uh, samurai stipends and these foreign instructors. The majority of the national budget was just their personnel cost. So the policy of Bume Kaikai, civilization enlightenment came along, and I'll leave this, and I remind people that this is going to be recorded. If you're interested in this fine print, you can go back and look at the recording later, and there's a lot of information from some great books that I put in here. But essentially, you have the Japanese leading a sort of bifurcated life where they, where they dress in uh, Western clothes, and they have Western furniture, Western dishes, but they also have a dual lifestyle where they wear Japanese clothes. And they, of course, for Japanese food, you need Japanese dishes and, and preparation methods. So it's kind of expensive, but that's what they do. And it, to, even today, most Japanese in, in a, in a semi-traditional home or something will have a tatami room, right, or more. And that's that goes back to this time, the Bume Kaika. So how was life in the empire when this comes up? And so it was it was not necessarily great to be um, a member of the of the empire, a, 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 a colonist in the empire, because they only got 50 to 60 percent of the wages of the Japanese doing the same thing. But despite that, the entire trade between Korea, Japan, China, uh, sorry, Korea, uh, Taiwan and Japan was less than that of uh, the trade with China. That's why China is so important all the time to the Japanese. It's it's more uh, the trade is more important than the entire trade of the empire. So what are the Japanese companies that are coming along at this time? What are they faced with? They're faced with a very low level of education, yet they're trying to catapult into the upper levels of uh, modern industrial uh, technology. So, so they have to take people out of the school. They have to convince farmers that their kids, that their sons mostly, and even their daughters have to go to school. They have to go to school to become literate so they can be taught in the factories and in those factories once they got someone that was a baseline literate then they would train them so that trend continues even today uh, the trend of lifetime employment and then education 
and a sort of paternalistic uh, approach to the employees that uh, most Westerners find very surprising. But part of the training was, how are we going to keep these people in place? So at the same time, the English, where you would have an in, in individual's te technical ability would allow them to go from company to company and continue to progress and uh, increase in responsibility and salary. The Japanese wanted to stop all of that because they had invested in these people. And part of that was training the, the national character. And part of that national character was gonna be formed by the Japanese government. Shinbutsu Bunri it was separating uh, Shinto, which is a, uh, an evolved form of Taoism from China and Buddhism, which also came from China. These had merged for hundreds of years. They're essentially the same thing. But in 1868, the Meiji government, this is how important it was. One of, one of the first things the Meiji government did was separate Buddhism and Shinto. They wanted to defang the Buddhists uh, because they've been very powerful in their own right and then have Shinto as something that the state could control. Meanwhile, even though it wasn't a, a great uh, priority, the Japanese government is tinkering in Korean uh, politics. Here's Kano's father-in-law, Takezoi Shinichiro, who's a minister in Seoul, and he goes in, to a bunch of disgruntled Koreans and convinces them to have a rebellion. And then when the reaction of the government is so strong, he actually uh, cl closes the gates of the, the Japanese embassy where they're trying to escape. And the, the whole mission, the, the Japanese diplomatic mission has to run away uh, and they come back. This sets the stage for the later war with China. So the emperor promulgates the new constitution in 1889 and becomes effective in November, uh, November 1890. And it's based essentially on German law. And then, by the way, this beautiful facility still exists today. You can see it in Tokyo. So the emperor is set up as the is the central to the government. He is the head of the government. He represents the he is the head of state. He's not just a representative. He heads the state for whatever that means. But the constitution is unclear. Is the emperor divine or is he an organ of the state? Meaning, does the state give him power or does he give the state power? And the constitution is not clear on this. And this sets up a huge uh, political battle in the Showa era in the 19, late 1920s, uh, 1930s, up to World War II. So the first election, uh, lower house election is held. Uh, only the lower house was properly elected. And, it, and the uh, the only people with suffrage, the, the voting right, were the handful of wealthy men. And they were all well known because they published the uh, the rates at which they paid taxes. And that was actually done until even fairly recently. And here we are where one man's voting while the rest, everybody else looks on. This is actually a French cartoonist uh, version of a description from a French uh, man who watched the election. So these are all home ministry officials and the police who work for the home ministry. So it's very powerful. And he's, he's putting a ballot in. Of course, they know who put what ballot in because they're only a handful of men. So it's, it wasn't like secret elections. So the question became, what would what would they do with the? Uh, how would you define the new Japanese culture? You could, here here's a country that could do this from anything. They could pick anything they wanted. There were there were arguments to adopt Western culture, nobility, the peasants, and they're all very very different cultures, all in the same uh, island group. It's not even a country. And the answer is samurai. So what is a modern Japanese samurai about? He is a Con Confucian loyalist. Everybody is an imperial subject. Uh, they're dealing with martial arts. They're dealing with Bushido, the way of the warrior. And then they're, clearly there are thought problems. Anything anti-imperialist, socialist communism is, is looked upon with great uh, trepidation because they see what's going on in, the West, in Western Europe and those problems are tearing countries apart. Okay. So these confusion documents, the imperial rescript of soldiers and the rescript on education set the tone for all of Japan. This is how the imperial subject should be. Everybody should strive to, to meet the, uh, the virtues of the soldier is essentially what they're saying. Everyone has to learn. So you should look at the imperial rescript on education, which is, which is held almost as sacred inside every school in Japan. It's essentially, uh, Confucianism with the emperor replacing heaven. And it sets up an entire problem, a, tick, a political time bomb. The, the rescript says that the emperor is divine. He is a descendant of gods. And that establishes the Kokutai, Jap Japan's national polity, which means that that is one of the most uh, important aspects of Japanese 
government and culture is that the emperor is divine. And it says so right in the rescript. Our imperial throne, coeval with heaven and earth. So he encompasses everything. So let's go back to Korea, where the Japanese are, are dragging the Koreans, uh, the Chinese into a confrontation over the rights in Korea with the Russians looking on. Uh, so the Russo-Japanese War comes along, and everybody's everybody in the world is astonished that Little Japan, and here it is in Punch, which is a popular magazine at the time, Tiny Japan takes on the Chinese giant and defeats them completely. What happens is that the broad streets of the uh, newspapers in Japan are sensational wartime reporting. Uh, nationalism jumps up in Japan to a level never before seen, and people are all of a sudden are very interested in martial arts. There's a martial arts association established and has, has membership in the millions within decades. Uh, Kano himself is publishing a magazine and it, every, mag every edition talks about the exploits uh, of its uh, military members. So Japan, uh, this is a Western cartoon, of course, Japan thought it would be welcome to the club, the Western club of imperialists. And here are all the imperial, Western imperialist nations, your caricatures, the Turks, the British, you know the Russians, and they thought they would be welcome. Of course, they weren't welcome. This is this is the last thing that the imperialist Western powers wanted was a competitor in any of this. So they were not welcome. And the triple intervention uh, was was three nations that argued against Japan's occupying Manchuria and taking some plum uh, territory, uh, argued against it, and Japan settled for an increased uh, war reparation from China, paid in solid silver. And a couple of years later. Strangely enough, China decides to modernize its entire education system using Japan, Japan's help. And why did they do that? They thought it was easier to team with Japan. Travel to Japan was really cheap. It's cheaper to live here than in the West. Um, they, the Japanese had already translated all the books that the, Jap that the Chinese were interested in. And Japan agreed to fund the war with Chinese war reparations. So essentially, China was paying itself, working off its debt to Japan and modernizing its education system. And there were thousands of these Chinese involved, but it wasn't uniformly a good experience. Uh, many of the Chinese were uh, ridiculed and set upon because of the war and because of uh, their dress and everything else. So free of the the Qing repression in, in uh, China, many of these people became politically active and it led in many ways to the 1911 Chinese revolution. And by the way, up until now, here we are in early 1900, Japan doesn't even have a common language. Uh, there is no such, by the way, there is no such thing as a Japanese language. It is kokugo. It literally ask any Japanese who studied the language, even up to today, the uh, the language is called the national language. It does not say, you know, in high school you study Nihongo, you study Kokugo. So it's quite interesting that way. And it's it is not an artificial language, but is based on the uh, prestige dialect of Tokyo, which makes sense because it was the generations of uh, samurai administrators who set up a common language that was greatly influenced by Shibuya dialect. Uh, if you can imagine that, uh, close to where I live, because there was a small castle here that brought a dialect up from Mus Musashi no Kuni. And then how, the question was, how do you write it? But the original uh, suggestion was to adopt English. Can you imagine the world today if Japan had adopted English as its common language? Uh, and there was a very serious argument in 1902, 1903, is that that was what Japan should do in order to make the greatest progress in the shortest period of time. But uh, the uh, cult, uh, cultural conservatives pushed back and they had to choose a Japanese solution. This was not only limited to men, I won't go over this uh, much, but uh, Shimoda Utako was a pioneering uh, Japanese female educator. And the Russo-Japanese War comes along. Um, Roosevelt doesn't want either side to get too strong because America is outside of China looking in, so it wants to be able to play the power broker. But I have evidence from my research that the Japanese actually put a spy in the, in the Teddy Roosevelt White House. Uh, J Japan's win was like the uh, Sino-Japanese war is a big uh, shock, um, but even early on, uh, Japan became aware that this was a, a win that was going to cost them a huge amount, almost 20% of the working male population was mo mobilized, they sent a million men to the war, they had over 100,000 casualties, 
Japan's almost bankrupt and they had riots in the streets of Tokyo trying to kill the negotiating team that came back with the with the deal from Portsmouth that Teddy Roosevelt had helped uh, negotiate. Okay. So about this time, judo is introduced to the world and, and it come, becomes part of the popular vernacular is how does tiny Japan uh, fight off these giant powers? And it's through judo. Uh, and that becomes uh, part of the popular culture for many years to come. About this same time, the United States uh, has problems with uh, Jap uh, Japanese immigrants. Chinese, first with the Chinese, then with the Japanese, and particularly in California, where they're coming into the agricultural areas, they're, they're living together, there are questions of uh, integration in the schools, and there's this whole uh, back and forth between J Japan and the United States where, where they try to not make it a public uh, diplomacy issue, but they essentially, uh, on the Japanese side, cut off immigration to the United States by controlling exit visas, not allowing passports. And that's how they avoid the sanctions. Um, in 1905, and in, in response to this, the United States uh, recognizes Japanese influence in Korea in 1905, they get a protectorate treaty. And then in 1910, Korea becomes, is formally uh, annexed by Japan. The, the Emperor Gojong abdicates. The real prize for all of this is not necessarily Japan or, or Korea, but it's Manchuria. This is in the French. And here we have the British playing the tune, the Japanese dancing to it. This is all about British financing of the expansion of the Japanese empire and trade with them and a security treaty. Uh, and of course, the Chinese are stuck in the middle trying to keep, keep away from the Russians and the Japanese with the British pulling the strings, playing the tune in the background. Well, what's that about? So the so the Russians have taken over outer Manchuria, which is this part here in pink, and inner Manchuria is 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 a, has this very strange history because it was the homeland of the Qing, the Manchu, who uh, were the non-Han Chinese who came into China uh, hundreds of years ago and took over, and they kept it almost as a, like a nature preserve, so sort of a nostalgic area. So they never really developed it. So there's this ma massive uh, landmass that's that's very resources rich and underdeveloped. It's still underdeveloped today. They're actually Chinese from the area who say we should have stayed with the Japanese. At least they invested in the place. Uh, and it's kind of a bitter uh, comment on the lack of interest from the from uh, Beijing and and the and the coastal provinces of China to invest in Manchuria or the <laughs> sorry the uh, the current Chinese provinces. So very soon there were organizations set up in Japan to. Uh, that set the stage for the mi militarism of the 20s and the 30s. Uh, local improvement movements, remembering that even by 1900, 80% of the population in Japan is rural. So they have these uh, movements to get people to, to uh, reorganize their hamlets, their, their cities, their towns, and then have nationalism and have control, have social control over these. Uh, that includes youth, youth schools and organizations. Uh, one of the most misunderstood organizations in Japan at the time is the Imperial Military Reservist Association, Zaigo Gunjinkai, um, which has over 3 million members and essentially in every town in Japan. Um, and it's it kind of a combination of John Birch Society, military reservists, and social workers all combined. Um, Shinto shrines are addressed very directly. They they, they the government forces about 40% of them to, to shut down and they start funding them directly to take over. What's the purpose? They're trying to avoid what they see happening in Western societies. They're trying to build nationalism. They want to provide, provide military training and support mobilization. Uh, all of this, um, Japan gets the opportunity to see how Western powers have done it and they adopt these uh, mechanisms. And these are these are Japanese who, on the other side, took Japanese culture and exported it to the world uh, through teaism, bushido, out of the east, uh, martial arts, and the swordsmanship. Okay, so here's a scorecard. 1868, you saw eight, Japan. 1868. What's happening by 1912, which is the death of the uh, Emperor Meiji, and here is Japan is completely independent. The unequal treaties have been rene renegotiated. The empire is huge. A position in Manchuria um, is recognized by the world. The Chinese informal empire, the trade with China is bigger than that of the entire um, 
the entire empire. The Japanese trade with China is greater than that of the entire empire. The population is double, remembering most of that still out in the countryside. They have the strongest military in Asia and a superb education system. What are their problems? Their finance, national finance is a problem. Labor issues are, are mounting. Uh, democracy is still limited. It's very, uh, very rudimentary form of democracy. We call it a, a guided democracy. Essentially, uh, everything is rigged, and the and the diet has little or no power. Um, and, but the Chinese Revolution creates this huge danger and opportunity for Japan. What is Japan going to do? So we're at the end of the Meiji era, ready to go World War One and everything that follows after that. So what are we talking about here? Here's China broken up, uh, spheres of influence. This is 19, right before the revolution. Um, it's chopped up by all these countries. Here's a Japanese influence. Here's a Japanese empire, which looks like this. All the way from the 50th parallel in Sakhalin to the edge of the Kamchatka Peninsula, all the way down to the southern tip of Formosa and here in Dalian, uh, Harbin, I'm sorry, Dalian and Port Arthur. What is that? Let's take this. It looks like that superimposed on the United States. That's a very big area. This is 1.4 million square miles. So you have to have a lot of people, a lot of administration, a lot of a, a local autonomy doing, trying to get them to do what the uh, central government wants them to do. And that's uh, about it. I'm sorry it took so long. Thank you so much, Colonel. We really appreciate your time today. And that was a really, really informative uh, presentation. Um, so if we if we can start with the Q&A session, I'd like to start off with a question. Um, so I'm curious, like um, you mentioned a lot of uh, elements of, of the Meiji era, era and how uh, Japan was able to, you know, really modernize and I guess evolve in such a short period of time. What would you say are like the major factors or the main factors of Japan's kind of fast revolution during this period? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm I have a, some background noise. Could you ask the core of the question again, please? Yes. Uh, what are the major factors or the main factors, do you think, of Japan's uh, evolution during the Meiji uh, era or the Meiji Restoration? Well, I think it, uh, I did it rapidly, but the, but the primary factor is domestic development in order to... Um, allow Japan to renegotiate the unequal treaties on an equal basis with the Western powers. This was a danger to any Japanese government. The, the, the notion, uh, the pride of the Japanese people, the, so at the, at the same time they're trying to build Japanese nationalism, they want the Japanese to, to swallow the fact that they have these unequal treaties. You see what I'm saying? Like, we Japanese are special. We have an emperor. I mean, the emperor is descended from the heavens. There's no one on the earth that like this. Yet we have to listen to the foreigners who force these unequal treaties on us. So that that dichotomy, that that uh, juxtaposition of these two extreme uh, positions could destroy any government. So constantly, the, the the people in charge of the Meiji government are criticized by anybody on the outside from uh, from their lack of progress in dealing with these. So that's why they spent so much time. So the, the, the legal system was a huge issue. They imported much of the French uh, French civil code into, into Japan rather than rewrite it because they just had to get something that the foreign powers would agree to. And it's a tremendous change from uh, the legal mechanisms that were in um, uh, in the Tokugawa, does that make sense? It does to, yes. to me that to me that's the biggest driver. The domestic the domestic issues. We must fix our domestic issues in order to uh, meet the Western powers on an equal level. In fact, with Japanese ambassadors weren't called ambassadors. They, they were not. Uh, an ambassador is from a, a le equal level country to another country. The amb Japanese ambassadors were called ministers. They were not. Uh, they were not called ambassadors until um, uh, all of them until around 1910 or so. Thank you so much. Um, so to begin, uh, questions from the chat. Patricia Yarrow asked, "If the children of the uh, Eta were outcast." Uh, was that the end, or were they all subsequent generations classified as outcasts? If so, the out outcast numbers would expand exponentially. 
bear in mind that the Japanese population itself was expanding uh, at a rapid rate. It doubled, um, it, it almost doubled in 45 years. That's a tremendous, um, that's a tremendous rate of population growth. The Meiji government approach to that was to make everybody a commoner. So when I showed up here, it was still a, uh, a significant issue. And even today, there are there are associations of the descendant of these people, um, and they seek, uh, you know, they seek redress from the government. They seek economic support. They control certain uh, economic activities. It's pretty interesting to dig into it. But uh, on paper, legally, they're commoners. So what happened was that. It was very common when I first came here almost 40 years ago that someone getting married, they would hire a detective to go find out the background of your daughter's uh, fiance. And if they if they were, in fact, of the wrong social class, uh, parents would try to squash the uh, uh, the the engagement. Um, and there are companies that actually did that sort of thing. You don't hear about it now. I wouldn't be surprised if it still happens to a certain degree. But uh, working working themselves into the workforce and uh, progressing uh, economically certainly helped, uh, but those echoes, and that's why I presented that sort that issue. Those echoes continued even to when I first came here. Uh, thank you so much. Um, kind of to add to her question, um, so you in your presentation you mentioned how um, Japan over this period was adding to its empire. So for like um, you know Korea and Okinawa, like the people from those areas, were they also a part, like, would they also be classified in specific classes? Were they even considered commoners at this time? Well, that's a good question. Uh, they were, they were not in the, uh, in the normal, in the standard Meiji uh, class system. They were outside of that. Uh, although the Japanese took great pains to uh, socially identify people who were supportive of um, the empire and they gave them awards. Um, they recruited uh, pretty heavily in Taiwan and in Korea um, from the Imperial Army. In fact, the, the core of the modern Korean army republic of korea army and much of the uh D dprk the north korea's army the uh, the core of that actually came from former uh officers in the um, uh, japanese imperial army many of the uh, class uh, class b and c war criminals who were uh prison guards during world war ii were in fact recruited from korea uh the taiwanese uh tended to be more in logistics uh, capacity in the in the military but they didn't go into the the class system as such. Um, they were they were colonist, uh, not uh, not core Japanese. They were they were members of the um, of um, they were imper imperial subjects, and the Japanese were careful to put Shinto shrines, state Shinto shrines, all over the empire, including uh, t taking them to uh, Indonesia and places like that. Uh, but anyway. Um, they're kind of outside the system also. That's interesting. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, to kind of finalize her question, uh, when did a generation stop like being classified as an Etta? Well, well, legally, it was when the Meiji um, when the Meiji government established, my understanding is when the Meiji government established the new system with the three layers, the Kazoku, the, the uh, former nobility, the Shizoku, former samurai, and everybody else is a Hamin, commoner. Uh, my understanding is that is when. Um, now, the, the prejudices that were built up over hundreds of years continued into the modern era, Pat, beyond Meiji, in which, um, for example, in the official census, and I don't know when this stopped. I, I was told this, or I read it one time uh, years and years, decades ago, um, that the official census actually used instead of the counter for people, which is you know hito, uh, they use the counter for large animals uh, to uh, account for um, the outcasts. And you can see those records. I mean, the National Diet Library has them. 
Uh, you can actually go back and look at the census and see there's this certain town, you know, village outside of Osaka that has a whole bunch of large animals, not people. I mean, it's pretty strange, but that's the way it was. Um, moving on to Vivian Ng's question. While Emperor Meiji was a teenager uh, back when the Meiji Restoration took place, as he grew older, how much influence did he actually have in the subsequent development of the Meiji government and its policies? Well, certainly, the careful propaganda of the Meiji government was that he was uh, highly intelligent, very involved, um, always asking insightful questions. And of course, this, all of this is done in the privacy of a room with a handful of courtiers and official government <laughs> bureaucrats. So it's it's really difficult to say. Um, he was certainly a, a more uh, dy dynamic and uh, revered ruler than was his son, the Emperor Taisho, um, who was a completely different character. Meiji was sort of a uh, bigger than life, probably, you know, he's the last emperor that didn't have um, his reign chopped up into a, a bunch of different eras. So you have the Meiji era, which is 45 years. I don't, you know, it's, it, it ranks up there with Queen Elizabeth. I mean, the longevity in and of itself is very impressive. So how, how much did he actually do? You know, who knows? Um, you, you can read a number of biographies of his, and he's a, he's a fascinating man, but I, I would... Uh, I would question any any such biography as a hagiography rather than uh, inside, because very few people will ever know, and they're all dead. So, so um, how would you contrast like Emperor Meiji's involvement in the government in comparison to the Emperor Showa and the Emperor Taisho? The Emperor Taisho was. Uh, well, this goes beyond Meiji 101, but but they are completely different people. The Emperor Taisho was portrayed in history um, not particularly sympathetically as as a uh, very weak, physically weak person um, who ends up being in a regency. So the the Crown Prince Hirohito, who becomes uh, the Emperor Showa. Um, actually takes takes over as regent, and there's one uh, particular episode that's quite interesting, where he's he's given a speech to give at the Diet at the Parliament, um, and they've got the assemble, the upper house, the lower house, the emperor's there, and he takes the speech and he rolls it up, and he rolls it into a a tube, and he looks, he just stands there and looks through it for um, 30, 45 minutes, and then finally come up and ask him to leave the stage and he stops making many public appearances after that and then he's he's taken ill and he, he disappears now there's research uh, today that indicates that he what he was doing was in fact um lodging a protest against the things he was forced to do he did not want to do and therefore um, he, he's very limited in, in what he could actually do and, and was forced to do uh, to support policies that he did not think were in the best interest of the people of Japan. So, you know, these things, sometimes they take a very long time to work out. Uh, the Emperor Showa, um, commonly called Hiro, Hirohito, by his, uh, pretty Im impertinently by his first name, um, it was a was a different character, and that's that's still a huge uh, matter of academic discussion. Uh, he he was, um, I think, much more involved in the day to day uh, strategy and things like that. But then World War II comes along, and the Tokyo trials, uh, the Tokyo war criminal trials. Um, and there was a conscious decision that was actually coordinated by one of Kano Jigoro's students. There's a conscious decision to hide the uh, any mention of the involvement of the Showa emperor in such a thing. In fact, um, uh, Tojo Hideki, in response to a line of questioning, uh, is asked, uh, was was the emperor involved? And everybody else up until Tojo Hideki had said, of course not. Um, and he was asked the, the question directly, 
did you keep the emperor informed? Did he know what was going on? He slams the slams the witness bench and says, of course I did. The emperor knew everything. I kept him. And he stopped and he said, no, he didn't know anything. Why? Because they had agreed to keep any testimony out of the court that would indicate that the emperor was involved. So they're very different people in very different times. That's very interesting. Thank you so much. And so the next question comes from Jeff, Jeff Newman. Um, it seems that education was key while commerce was at the bottom. Can you comment on the role of business in Japan's transformation? I will um, I, I will send Jeff. I think I already did. Uh, there's a there's a marvelous book written by a Japanese lecturer named Morishima, uh, who was a lecturer at King's College in London, and it's it's the the one book I would recommend to business people trying to figure out the history of Japan. Um, and he started with a, a group of just some notes and. He was teaching Japanese economics to uh, Westerners, mostly English, in King's King's College, and he realized they didn't know anything about Japan culturally. So he gives what I think is one of the best cultural introductions to Japan, and he points out that these are these are parallel tracks that the education uh, became very Confucian, even though they changed the name to become uh, supportive of the imperial throne. Uh, and Japan's kokutai, uh, which is the emperor and the, and, the, and the entire emperor system. But the business, the, the Meiji government, and remember that they're looking at examples uh, throughout the world, and they think that, well, you know, Germany has a national arsenal and they have a national shipyard, so we should run these things. We should, we should uh, set up a national shipping line. We should set up an arsenal. We should set up a shipyard. And it was a disaster. They didn't know how to run it. So they brought in, they, they, they essentially, like the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union, where they had all these state enterprises that were kind of poorly run and, you know, uh, overstaffed and unprofitable, and they sold it off to some private individuals. And it was interesting how they sorted out over the decades what sort of individual they needed. Um, they wanted someone who was supportive of the overall objectives of the Meiji government. So they wanted somebody who was uh, working for profit, but were not mercantilists to the point that they would harm the government or the people by excessively uh, by excessively uh, focusing on profits, right? Um, does that make sense? They, it, it took some experimentation. I think Morishima, um, I think Morishima actually uh, does a great job of explaining how that developed over time. And so what, of course, it's like Russia, you end up with some very filthy rich oligarchs, but they, they owe the government, the government owes them. So it's back and forth. Um, so it is a very interesting evolution. And I recommend it's in the chat now. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Um, that's actually the the book that I mentioned, and I, and I highly recommend it to any adult who wants to, to learn uh, about early Japan. Thank you so much. Uh, so Bron Davis asks uh, or says, it is uh, it's sad to notice how invisible women and girls were in the Meiji era. Could you please speak about what roles and influences they had? Well, that's probably my failing more than the failing of the women and girls. Um, there are um, there are some key figures that you can look at. One is that uh, lady that I posted, Shimoda Utako. Um, and another is Suda, and I forget her given name. Um, there were a group of five Japanese women who went early on at private expense um, to study in the United States and came back, and they were very influential in uh, women's education. Kano Jigoro, the subject of my um, my own history, the Kano Chronicles, uh, was very involved in promoting women's education. Now, his, his view was women's role in society is within that Confucian hierarchy. 
uh, that their their role is best understood as uh, wife, man and wife, and that relationship is very important. Um, and they should they should learn how it's like home ec, you know, uh, home ec on steroids. It's it's everything about everything from ethics to fam uh, home management to uh, dealing with the latest trends to educating your children to become better uh, imperial subjects. So pe people are doing that for different uh, different reasons. And then you, there, there are leftists that come out uh, during the Taisho era and beyond. The Taisho era is very different where women start to step to the forefront uh, more. And some of them in uh, quasi-revolutionary roles, um, some of them in, in anti-imperialist roles, which gets some of them uh, imprisoned and others of them killed. Uh, because you had to be careful at how far you pass that envelope. But it, bear in mind, it wasn't until 1946 uh, during the occupation where women were actually given uh, the right to vote. Yes, thank you, Patricia. That's who I'm thinking of. I know Tsuda Umeko. So if you look at if you look at Shimoda uh, Utako and and Tsuda Umeko, you've got the kind of bookends for that this period, Meiji period of education. I'm sure there are other women that are, that are less famous, but I think those two are the best uh, documented and the most interesting. Thank you so much for the book uh, recommendation. Um, and so uh, I guess the final uh, question uh, comes from David Fitzgerald. Uh, can you address the 1868 Kobe incident uh, incident as in how many U.S. Marines from the U.S. ships were there and how long was the occupation of Kobe by the U.S.? Well, that's a good question. I'm trying to determine the actual strength of uh, both sides. Um, it wasn't a tremendous number. But bear in mind that, that when the Japanese signed the unequal treaties to open the treaty ports, they then they then drug their feet the entire time as, as long as they could because there are all kinds of uh, physical security guarantees. Um, they had to make preparations for buildings that were acceptable to the foreign governments to become their legations, their diplomatic liaison points. Um, so they were they were literally there. Uh, it, it turned out that that day was like the worst possible day to have a gun battle with the with the foreigners because there's a whole bunch of them there for the formal opening of Kobe. The original treaty says Hyogo, uh, and at that time Hyogo Port was a separate port, um, it, but it was so crowded that the Japanese, uh, the Bakfu, the previous government, the the, the uh, shogun's uh, government said, look, we we can't shoehorn you into Hyogo. It's completely full. We're going to develop this fishing town next door. It's called Kobe. It's just a little fishing port. That's going to become the uh, treaty port. And of course, uh, since they're under treaty, they had to go back and negotiate with all the countries that that was okay. So meanwhile, they had a bunch of people sneak in, uh, you know, people jumping the gun to the formal opening and going in and buying and uh, renting houses and setting up things up. So it turned out that there were, there were more U.S. Marines and such that there would have normally been, and some of them probably a small detail. So good question. If you find the answer, you let me know, because uh, I, I'd like to know. But the, the shock to the Japanese was that that Bizen samurai unit was actually armed with re uh, repeating guns, you know, like you know, John Wayne, bang, bang, bang. They could shoot rapidly, and the and the uh, foreign Marines were actually more like a single shot and, and maybe some bolt actions. But so uh, it, it's a good question. Like I say, I haven't been able to determine the exact number. But accidentally, but because of the ceremony, the Japanese had put most of their modern warships in the port. And of course, they're anchored and they've got a small crew and they go into town. Everybody's getting ready for the ceremony. And then all of a sudden, the foreigners seize almost all of the modern Japanese fleet. And this is a disaster, and it doesn't even show up in Japanese history books. Why? They wanted to disappear it. They wanted to make sure that nobody thought that that was something that could happen. Uh, so I was very surprised to find out about this uh, many, uh, many years after my initial uh, exposure to Japanese history. 
Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much again, Mr. Gatling, for your presentation today and taking time out of your day to be with us. And once again, thank you to our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York, for funding this series. Thank you everyone for joining us and for all of your wonderful questions. As usual, we really appreciate your time. Um, and if you would like to uh, read more about um, Colonel Gatling or um, any of the information that he showed on his presentation today, it will be posted on your, our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thank you.